high school, here we go, relationship goals session two. Good to see you. Why don't you open up the Bible with me to Ruth chapter one? Can we do that together? Um, while you're turning there, I just kind of want to get you a uh, kind of get you a feel, get get you to get a feel for tonight. So I'm not going to stand and preach this at you. All right. So here's what I want this to to feel like. This is kind of like that, that deal where, you know, you are sitting across the table from someone who's just going to share with you some biblical wisdom when it comes to relationships, okay? So I really want this to feel like a talk. I want you to imagine with me that you are in this seat, and in this seat is someone that you would love to talk to about how they could inspire you, how they could motivate you, how they could instruct you to have a proper godly, biblical relationship that God would bless so that you would have an incredible life together with your spouse forever. You got me? All right, let's pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight, and and God, we just pray that you would speak to us. God, that you would speak to us through your word, and Father, that we would love it, we would hear it, and God, we would live it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said... Amen. Now, I've heard it said a lot of times, and let there be Starbucks. I love this. Okay, good. So it just appeared out of nowhere. This, this brings us kind of the coffee shop feel. What do I have here? A tall white mocha. Okay, got that. We also have, by the way, where's Steven at? Is Steven in the house? Did he come in? Steve, are these warmed up, Steven? Did these make it to the microwave? No? They didn't? Kind of, sort of? Okay, they're, war- they're, they're kind of warm. Okay, I'm going to give these back to you so we can throw them in the microwave. Can that, is, that, is that cool? Okay, so here we go. A tall white mocha, tall white mocha, and we have a hot chocolate. Any tall white mocha fans in the house? Y'all like ch- uh, white chocolate mochas? Anybody? That's a hot chocolate right there. Got it, got it. Okay, who loves, anybody love Starbucks hot chocolate? You love Starbucks hot chocolate? Are there any, are there any first timers here? Anybody's first time ever? Liars. Anybody's first time to Epicenter? First time tonight, first time ever on Wednesday night, first time. Where? I, I'm seeing a hand. Right here? Right here? Really? Right here? Oh, and who brought you? Who brought you? They're they right here. These two guys, are okay, Gentile and your buddy. Look, I, I'm going to give these to y'all right here. Come, come here, come here, come here. Y- y'all get these right here. Come on, come on up, come on up. Man, I'm going to give you, Gentile, you too, brother, you too. Come on, I'm going to give you guys a free Starbucks right here, man. So hot chocolate. This is not a date, I know, I know, but I'm going to give you guys hot chocolate, right? So hot chocolate and a white chocolate mocha. If y'all want Steven to warm those up, man, that's good. But we always celebrate the fact. First timers here, we love to have with us, okay? So, I've heard it said a lot before that one of the best love stories of all time is actually in this movie called, I don't even know if y'all have seen it from many years ago, but man, I, well, there was so much, man, just chatter about it constantly, but it was called The Notebook. Have y'all ever, y'all ever heard this? Any lovers of The Notebook? Anybody get excited over The Notebook? Who all saw The Notebook? Raise your hand. You saw The Notebook, okay? Anybody, The Notebook is your favorite movie of all time? Okay, just checking. Sam Pennington in the house. Notebook. All right, so I've heard it said many times that The Notebook is like, the world's best love story of all time, right? And it's, it's an interesting movie, right? It starts off in the nursing home where the dude is like telling the story and then it goes back in time in like the, the 1940s and there was, there was Noah and there was Allie, right? And so there they were and, and they kind of fell in love as, you know, at this house and I, I think they went to a carnival together or whatever and then of course they're you know, their parents, like, her parents, like, just said, no, you, you cannot date him. He's trash, trash, trash. You're not allowed to date Noah. And, um, and so she, the parents, forbid Allie, I think her name was, from dating Noah. And then, um, so they, Allie and her family move away, and then Noah ends up going off to the war, right? And so, sure enough, years later, you know, providentially, they come back together, And the story goes that their love had been so strong over all of this time that they had not forgotten each other and they had been thinking about each other. And I think there were even some letters that that somebody didn't get in the story or something, right? And so so they they missed each other, they loved each other, and so they got back together. and, And even though Allie was engaged, Noah and Allie started having sex together. You know, it's like, I've even, heard, I've even heard youth pastors say before, this is the greatest love story of all time. And she's cheating on her fiancé, having sex with another dude. Like, 
For some people, it may be the greatest love story of all time, but not for her fiance, it's not, right? Like, it's not a very good story for him. And so, and so, you know, ultimately people call it the best love story of all time, of course, because they get married and they die together in the nursing home holding hands, right? All at the same time. Sorry, uh, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, so sorry. So, and I'm not even telling you to watch it, but I'm, I bring it up to say this. I bring it up to say this. Um, so often, we allow the world to hardwire us with thoughts and desires and goals when it comes to relationships. And so, and so as we watch the world, right, and, and, and I love movies, but as we watch the movies, and I love the music, and as we listen to the music, and, and as we watch the TV shows, or, or get advice from people who, who don't necessarily love Jesus, you got to remember, every time, if you're not careful, every time it will begin to supersede God's word in your life to where you will begin to think more like the world than like his word. And by the way, let's just be honest. I know this does not happen every time, but just to be honest, when it comes down to relationships, we have to be very careful because what the world is promising, it doesn't deliver. So you think about people that, that don't love Jesus in relationships. Again, I know there's a lot of noble and, and, and respectable people, but I've seen so many relationships that, you know, when, when, when you're together, that there are people of the world because, because they don't love the Lord, you know, they, they tend to flirt with other people than the person they're in a relationship with. And sometimes they get tired of the person that they're dating, and so then they go to another relationship. Then they see somebody else that they want to date. They, they look a little better. They treat them a little nicer. So they go to that relationship, and, and so finally they've created that pattern in their life. And so finally one day when they think they, they're ready to get married, they get married, but then they've, they have this pattern in their life of, of man, they, they have a hard time really committing and being loyal and being faithful because of their dating life. And so they're in a marriage for a little while, but then someone else catches their attention. And someone else catches their attention, so they begin to flirt in marriage just like they were flirting and dating. And then before they know it, they're starting to give their heart to this person. So when, then when they give their heart to this person, then they start to distance themselves from their spouse. And then they start to say, you know what, I really want to spend time with this, this other person more so than my spouse. And so then, inevitably, a divorce happens. And then we know that children go through divorce. And then there's people left asking the question, man, is anybody faithful anymore? Does, does anybody, are, are they loyal to their marriage, to their spouse anymore? We know, we know that over 50%, and by the way, anything over 50% is a majority. Over 50% of marriages, the majority of marriages today end in divorce. The majority of marriages today, over 50% end in divorce. So just sitting here together, Imagining is just us talking. I want to walk you through the word. I, I, I want to show you the scriptures to what I believe points us to the best love story, the greatest love story of all time. And ultimately, just so you know, it's not, it's not Ruth and Boaz. Ultimately, it's Jesus and us. Ultimately, it's Jesus and you. So check this out with me real quick. In, in, in Ruth chapter 1, and, 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 and while I'm talking about these things and, and about to read this passage, I just I want to set a, a, a couple of rules up. Number one, number one, when we're going through this, I want you to understand that I am not encouraging dating. I'm not encouraging dating. Now let me explain myself. I do not necessarily believe that all dating is sin. I really don't. I want you to know that. So if you're in a dating relationship tonight, my goal for you is not to break up, okay? So it's not like, well, dang it, Pastor Chip's going to tell us to break up. My goal for you is not to break up, my, for you to break up. My goal for you is to simply live God's will for your life. That's, I mean, that's, that's the goal, right? If we're sitting together, man, I just want you to know, I just want you to live for Jesus and for you to do what God has called you to do because when we do what God calls us to do, that's the blessed life. That's the life that God blesses with us. And so, number one, I want you to understand, though, that we are not... In, this pa in these passages talking about dating, in, this pa in these passages, in, in these verses tonight, I want to talk with you about, ultimately, about marriage. And here's why. You might be thinking, dude, I'm 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Why are we talking about marriage? We're not even close to that because here's, here's, here's the deal. 
you've always got to start with the end in mind. Your goal, ladies, your goal is not to get a boyfriend. Dude, your goal is not to get a girlfriend. The goal for your life is to, for you to be a godly person who is appropriately prepared for the spouse that God has prepared for you. God's goal for your life is not boyfriend and girlfriend. God's goal for your life is husband and wife. God's goal for your life eventually one day is, 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 is father and his mother. And so as we talk about this, we will talk about premarital relationships. But I believe the goal is to have that one. That one premarital relationship that ends up in marriage. So let's check this out. This is the one book of the Bible. This is the one book of the Bible that really shares this story about what a premarital relationship just before marriage is supposed to look like. So check it out. I'm going to read a lot of Bible because I want God to speak into this, and I really want you to understand the story. Look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 says this. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and their two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Super weird names. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went into the country of Moab, and they remained there. But Elimelech, who was the husband of Naomi, Elimelech died. And she was left there with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, her two sons took them, took wives from Moab, and the name of the one was Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there for about 10 years, and then both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and left without her husband. So here's what we're starting off with. Right here, man, we're starting off, can we just be honest? We are starting off with tragedy. We start off with this lady by the name of Naomi. She is married to Elimelech. He dies. So her two sons, Malon and Kilion, who I think were stars in Star Trek, right? Malon and Kilion there. And so they get married. They marry Orpah and Ruth. And then those two, those two sons die, Malon and Kilion. They're dead. And so Naomi is left thinking, there's something wrong with me. I I'm broken. I'm cursed. I'm doomed. And so this love story starts off with tragedy. And the big point I want you to see from this passage real quick is godly relationships require faith. Write that down, put it in your phone, tweet it out or whatever, because we've got to understand this. Godly relationships require faith. Godly relationships require faith. Naomi was, I mean, she was depressed. She was so hurt because all of those who she loved in her life around her died. And so she's wondering, man, how can this turn out good? My husband has died. My sons have died. I've got these two, these two um, my daughters-in-law here, Orpah and Ruth. And man, how is this going to turn out well? And, and it looks like that they are, that this is just going to be terrible, right? It looks like that this is going to be awful, and so often it's easy to live a life to where we think, man, am I doomed? Like, am I cursed? And there may be some of you thinking in here, life has not started out so well. Like, I got people around me that, that man, they, they've died. I've got people around me to where you know, I, I come from a, a broken home, you might be thinking. You may be thinking, you know, man, Chip, I've been, I've been hurt in life. I've been mistreated. I've been abused. You just don't understand the way that people have treated me. And so obviously I'm worthless. Obviously I'm junk. Obviously God has not meant for me to have a good life. But here's what I want you to know. You have got to have faith in the Lord. You have got to have faith in the Lord. One quote I want you to hear tonight is, you are not defined by what has been, been done to your life, but you will be defined by what you do with your life. You are not defined by what has been done to your life, but you will be defined by what you do with your life. Meaning this, 
Your life may be very rough and it may be very tough and it may be just very difficult and a lot of suffering and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt as you've been living it, but you've got to understand, and everybody look at me, everybody look at me, you've got to understand that God has a plan for your life. That God is not absent with you. You are not the exception that God has left alone. You are not the one that says, you know what, that God says, I'm going to bless everybody, but that one person, I don't care about them. You're going to see here in this passage that Naomi had to have faith, but she was actually encouraged by faith by her daughter-in-law, Ruth. You know, I was, and we talked about this last week during the Q&A, I was 36. I was 36 years old when I married my wife, Michelle. And a lot of people for many years kept asking me, Chip, what do you think is going to happen, man? You know, before I was married, what do you think is going to happen? Like, like, do you think you're, you're supposed to be single forever? Or do you think that, man, do you think that God is just, man, you know, he's not going to bless you with a wife? You know, what are you going to do about this? And here's what I would tell him. Here's what I always, always tell him. I really believe that God has called me to be married, and I really believe and trust God that at his perfect timing that he is going to allow that to happen. And so I told him, here's the deal. If God can create a universe out of nothing, and if God can create this universe out of nothing, and if he can create humanity on that, in, in, on that earth in the universe to populate an entire planet, and if God can allow this humanity to fall into sin and then hundreds and thousands of years later he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and if, and, if, and if Jesus can seriously come as God down onto earth to be fully man and live his life in a perfection, sinless kind of a way and then end up, Jesus end up dying for all of our sin and being buried and coming back to life, resurrecting from the dead and literally bodily ascending to heaven to sit at the right hand of God where one day he's going to return. If God can do all that, he can send me a wife. And some of you may be thinking, Chip, if I live out the Bible, I will never get married because some of you ladies may be thinking, I will never find a man like that. And some of you dudes might be thinking, I could never find a woman like that. If I live this out, it couldn't happen. And here's what I want to explain to you. Godly relationships require faith in God. You've got to believe if God has commanded us to do this, then he will plan it out and make it happen in our lives because this is what he wants, not just from us. This is what he wants for us, and he will make it happen. Let's move on. Number two. Number two. Look at verse six. Look at verse six. Verse six says, So then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law, to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited the people and had given them food. So there's a famine in the land. So she set out from their place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant you May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Basically, real quick, what Naomi is saying is, listen, just go. Don't be around me. I'm cursed. I'm doomed. Just go. If you stick with me, if you stay here, you will not get remarried. I have nothing to offer you. Just go. Verse 9, that the Lord may grant that you find rest, each in, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, no, we will not return with you to your people. But Naomi, Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to Naomi. And she said, and Naomi said, see, look, your sister-in-law, Orpah, she is, she's going back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not 
urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you will go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. And where your people shall be, my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Number two, godly relationships, very quickly, godly relationships require obedience. Godly relationships require obedience. Now, I want you to think about this. Think about this. Ruth was choosing obedience for her life over convenience. Ruth was choosing obedience over convenience. It would have been very convenient for her to be like, all right, Naomi, see you later, and, and um, you know, hopefully I'll catch up with you in a couple of decades. That's not what Ruth did. Ruth said, you know what? I'm, going, I'm not going to do the easy thing. I'm going to do the right thing. Why? Because Ruth trusted God. So Ruth said, I am going to stay here with Naomi and I am going to do the right thing because I feel like I believe that God has called me into this family and so therefore I need to obey God. Now, I want to encourage you. In order to have a godly relationship, as godly relationships require obedience, number one, and you need to write this down or put it in your phone or whatever you need to do, number one, it is obedience to God first. Obedience to God first. If you believe, if you believe that the blessed relationship by God is best, then obey God. Right? I mean, we know that God can bless a relationship far better than we ever could. So if God, if it's up to God to bless the relationship, then first and foremost, we need to obey God. Then number two, secondly, and check it out, and this is so difficult, y'all. And I did not do this great as a teenager. And so I, I am not, you know, saint up here talking to sinners. This is sinner to sinners about the Savior. Number two, obey your parents. And here's what I've learned. And here's what I've seen over the years and years and years of friends getting married. You will only be as good of a husband or wife as you are a son or daughter. You will only be as good of a husband or wife as you are a son or daughter to your parents. And here's what I mean by that. There are so many teenagers today that do not get along with their parents because those are the people that they see every single day, day in, day out. And they feel like they have to please their parents all the time. And they feel like they need to do what their parents ask them to do. And they feel like that, you know, that they, that they that their parents aren't serving them like they should. And they're just, they're just all the time working to serve their parents. And so over, so they get in all these arguments and they get into all this complaining. And so then so many teenagers today start lying. And they start deceiving. And they start tricking their parents and lying to them, right? And then we see when they grow up and all that sin is in their life towards their parents, they can't stop the sin and the sin comes out against their spouse. And it's their spouse that they see every single day. And just like you loved your parent as, as a little kid, that when you become older, you get very routine and very get common and you get very used to them and you begin to mistreat them. And just like you fall in love with someone and then you marry them, that after a long time and they get very familiar with you and they get very common with you and they get very routine and, and normal and life sets in and then you start to have all that sin come out to where, man, you're just annoyed. And you think they are here to please you and you're not there to please them and they're asking you to do things that, that you don't want to do and so it, it, it all hits you all over again like you're stuck in this home, like you're stuck in this relationship. So what do we do? What do we do? Here's what we do. We see that living at home with your parents, with your mom and dad or one or the other, living at home is the best preparation for marriage because you're learning how to live together and to serve other people, to please them and make them happy because that's what marriage is ultimately all about. So the best preparation for marriage is not dating as many people as you possibly can for a lot of practice. The best preparation for marriage is actually being a godly son or daughter in your home as you serve your parents, 
and love your parents and obey your parents because those are the lessons that God has implanted in your life, designed in your life in order to grow as a godly husband or wife. Number three, real quick, write this down. Godly relationships require biblical attraction. Godly relationships require biblical attraction. I think this is my favorite area. Here we go. Verse, um, verse one in chapter two. Look at verse one in chapter two. It says this. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go. Go, my daughter, which means you go, girl, in verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. He was of the clan of Elimelech, and Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who is in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Speaking of Ruth. And the servant who is in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for just after a short rest. Now check it out. This is, this is kind of like that love at first sight kind of a thing. This is that deal where, where Boaz sees Ruth and Ruth sees Boaz and they are automatically attracted to one another. You know, that, that, that first initial attraction that everybody wants to experience. And so out of faith, they move back to Bethlehem and as they are in Bethlehem, um, Naomi, as they're at home, she starts to tell Ruth, you know, Ruth, there is a, a very nice young man I think you need to meet. In fact, he's this guy who are over the fields over there. And so, Ruth, here's what you need to do. You need to go out and you need to work hard and you need to glean in the fields. And you need to, you need to you know, gather food for us because Naomi's too old to do that. But while you do it, let's see if you could catch his attention. And so sure enough, she goes to the field, and there's Boaz. And here's the cool thing about Boaz. Boaz walks onto the scene. He walks into the field, and Boaz is the boss. Boaz is this, is this leader, boss kind of a guy. And as Boaz walks onto the scene, when he sees all of his workers, all of his reapers, Boaz does not say, let's go, get back to work. Y'all better work hard today. Let's do better today than we did yesterday. Guys, I'm watching you. You better do what you're supposed to do and work hard for me because I'm paying you. Instead, Boaz walks onto the scene and Boaz says to all of his workers, to all of his people, he says, hey guys, may the Lord bless you. And all the other people weren't like, Psh, what a hypocrite. Are you kidding me? Do you know how he treats us? Man, what a loser. Instead, they have this respect for their boss to where they all look up at Boaz and stop working for a second and say, hey, Boaz, may the Lord bless you too. Not only was this dude a leader, he was a loving leader. He was a guy that people loved to work for. He was a guy that people loved to be around. You know why? Because Boaz was not selfish with his leadership, but instead Boaz used his leadership to bless other people. And so Ruth sees that, and she's like, you know what? This is the type of guy that could take care of me. This is the type of guy who would truly love me. Here is the type of guy who would stay faithful to me. And then Boaz notices her. And all the Bible says that he notices about her. The Bible doesn't say that he notices what she looks like. The Bible says that he notices her character. It says that he's, he says as he's looking, he sees this woman who is working so hard, and he's wondering, who is she? And, and I believe, I mean, I really do believe that she is still physically attracted to him, and he is still physically attracted to her. I mean, I believe that is incredibly important, right? You need that physical attraction. And by the way, by the way, you will always be physically attracted to the one that God has prepared for you. And you need to hear me. You need to hear me on this. You will be physically attractive to the one that God has prepared for you. Everyone in here is created in the image of God. 
The Bible says about every single person in the room that we have all been fearfully and wonderfully made. And everyone needs to understand that you're exactly the way that God intended you to be. And that God has someone for you who will be attracted to you. But the most important part of attraction is not physical, but it's spiritual. It's character. It's reputation. And by the way, you need to write this down because here's what we see. Boaz, Boaz asks, who is she? Who is this woman? Tell me about her. And they told him about her reputation. Your reputation, high schoolers. I mean, this, this, I think this is so important for me to, for me to get across to you. You know, I, I really, gosh, I do not want to get up here and just preach a sermon to where it's like, you know, you're impressed or preach a sermon that you just laugh the whole time or preach a sermon to where, you know, it's like, okay, well, we'll just come back next week and we'll do it again. Like, I want this stuff to really sink down deep and infiltrate your life. I really do desire that you're like, okay, I get this. I see in the word of God what he is saying. And man, I, I feel what God is doing in me. And I want to respond and I want to live right. So that, and, and by the way, God is doing so much in me, I want to bring my friends with me. Like that, that's what I want the Holy Spirit to do in you. I do not write these things to impress you. I write these things because I want you to be impressed by God and who he is. You've got to remember, you've got to remember that your reputation will follow you wherever you go. Your reputation will follow you wherever you go. You do not want to be known for someone who is just all about their looks. And you don't want to live your life to where you are constantly just trying to make your looks better when the Bible calls us that we are ultimately seeking to become more like Jesus so that we attract the right person for the right reasons, not just because they're physically attracted to us, but because they can see, you know what? That's the type of person that I would love to get to know. That's the type of person that I would love to spend my time with. That's the type of person that I could see myself giving my life to. Because ultimately, you are not just marrying someone and sharing a bed. Ultimately, you're marrying someone and you're giving them your life. That's the person that you wake up next to every morning. That's the person that you're texting all day. That's the person that you, 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 man, you want your heart to race when you see their name show up on your cell phone. That's the person that you enjoy sitting across the table for two to three meals every single day and having conversation with them. That's the person that you want to have children with and to, and to actually like, have the same goals in raising children together, that's the type of person that you want to grow old with for the rest of your life. You better make sure you're not just attracted to them physically, but you are attracted to them spiritually and mentally, and that they are the type of person that would be able to give their life to you in faithfulness and loyalty too. And so what Ruth sees in Boaz is this loving leader, and what Boaz sees in Ruth is this woman who is loyal and faithful to her mother-in-law and is good to her and is working hard for her because she is so loving. Number four, real quick, biblical relationships require, require biblical manhood or biblical masculinity. Being a biblical dude. Check this out. This is really good. Verse eight. So then Boaz says to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go and glean in another, in another field, and, and don't leave this one. Don't leave my field, but keep close to my young women for protection. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and you just go after, you just follow them for protection. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? He was protecting her. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. You know what she saw in Boaz? Here's what, here's what she saw. He was not flirting with all the other girls, and, he just, and she just happened to be his favorite. You know what she saw in Boaz? She saw in him not just, not just that he was a guy that was going to make a lot of money one day, and not just a dude who was just, you know, just into her. She saw in him that he wanted to take care of her, not advantage of her. Because real true love is when you want to take care of someone and not take advantage of them. 
And so what Boaz was trying to do for her the entire time is saying, listen, I'm going to do what's best for you. I am going to protect you. I am going to take care of you, and I don't want to take advantage of you. And Boaz is, is constantly seeking to give to her and to bless her and to lead her and to love her. Man, it is this incredible love story to where we see people that we barely and rarely ever see today, pure intentions and motives who are trustworthy. And we need to be these types of people. Fellas, you'll see this on the screen. Your number one priority is to be a loving spiritual leader like Jesus. Your number one priority in life is to be a loving spiritual leader like Jesus. This is what we see in Boaz. Boaz was not just wooing her with all of his words. He was not just trying to be smooth. He was not manipulating her. He was not using his words to cut her down so that she felt so low that she, she thought that he was the best that she could do. Boaz did not yell at her. He did not make fun of her. And he did not hurt her in any way. In every single way, he wanted to build her up. In every single way, he wanted to take care of her needs. In every single way, he wanted to bless her and encourage her at all possible. So how did Ruth respond? Look, look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes? That you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found Favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not even one of your servants. You know what happened? Ruth remained so faithful to God that he blessed her at the right time with a man that she felt like she didn't deserve. Because she looked at all the other dudes. And she watched how all the other dudes, as cool as they may be, mistreat the woman they were with. Talk down to the girl they were dating. Or be spineless and weak and not a leader. And so she was wondering. She was wondering, like, she's thinking, I'm a widow. Like, I was married before. Who's going to want me? I've got some baggage in my life. Who's going to truly love me and take care of me? I've got some junk in my past. Like, who's going to accept me for what I've done or what's been done to me? And remember, your life will never be defined by what has been done to you. Your life will be defined by what you do with your life. And so Ruth is wondering all these things, but yet she remains so faithful and so obedient to God out of her faith. And God blesses her with a dude beyond her dreams. A man who does not take advantage of her. A man who does not mistreat her. But a dude who takes care of her and who truly loves her. And here's what she does. And, and guys, you need to hear this. And ladies, you need to hear this. Here's all she needs to do. That Boaz pursued her. Boaz blessed her. Boaz served her. Boaz helped her. And all she needed to do, check it out, was respond. Was respond to his love. Notice she did not have to chase him. She did not have to tell him, be my spiritual leader. She did not have to remind him, be good to me. Instead, she waited and she found the man who was blessing her because of his faith in God. And she was just awestruck with God, just saying, God, thank you so much for the man that you've given to me. Ladies, 
Valentine's Day is this Saturday. Is this Saturday. Do not feel, ladies, look at me, look at me. Do not feel like you have to have a boy on that day. Do not feel like that. Here's the deal. The last thing you want is the last dude, is, is, the, is the wrong dude in your life. That's the last thing you want. Do not ever date just to date. Never date just to date. You make sure that you are faithful to God because, listen, no dude, and please get this, no dude will ever bring you the significance and the acceptance and the love that you are looking for. We are not designed to be able to do that. I cannot even do that ultimately for my wife, Michelle. I can't. She has to get that from God, and then I just get to add to it. She cannot bring me all the significance and all the acceptance and all the love that I need. I have to get that from God, and then everything she gives me is just that extra added bonus. And so make sure from what we remember and what we learn in Scripture, what we remember and learn in Scripture that, ladies, your number one priority is to be a loving follower of Jesus, is to be a loving follower of Jesus. Because that, then one day, you will know how to respond to that man. Real quick, real quick, we got to move real fast. Number six, number six, godly relationships, and we'll do these last two real fast. Godly relationships require time together. Godly relationships require time together. It says this in verse 14. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her the roasted grain, and she sat until she was satisfied, and, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out from some of the bundles for her, and leave it to her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Real quick, dudes, he took her out to eat. He took her on a date. He took her on a date. Now, now check it out. He did not take her to a movie. Can we just make this clear? I know, there weren't any movies at that time, but, but, but think about this. Think about this. When it is time for you to date a woman, the one that you believe that God has for you to marry, make sure and take her to places where you can talk to her and get to know her. Don't pick her up in your car with your loud, thumping subs and turning them up all the way and boom, 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 all the way to the restaurant, right? She does not think that's cool. It gives her a headache. She does not love that. You do not look awesome to her at all. But instead, instead, look at me. Turn down the radio, ask her questions, and get to know her. All right, moving on. So it requires time together. It requires conversation. And the last thing, last thing, real quickly, and we won't even get into these verses, and we'll just, we'll just say this. Godly relationships require the gospel. Lastly, godly relationships require the gospel. Let, let me read this passage of Scripture for you, and then we'll be done. Re, um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. You need to write this down. Ephesians chapter 5. By the way, you need to write down Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, ultimately. You need to write this down, and here's why. This is the most helpful passage in all the Bible when it comes to marriage relationships. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 says this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Talking about getting married. And he says, this mystery is profound, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Listen, it all comes down to this. Relationships and, and, and everything that I'm trying to say and everything that God is calling you to do to be a, a godly man and to be a godly woman so that one day you can be a godly husband and one day you can be a godly wife. Here's what it all comes down to. You must be motivated by the gospel. That good news, that story of Jesus. Now, I know people are moving around, but look, zone in, hone in for me because this is the most important part. Jesus is the one who pursued us. Jesus is the one who came to this earth, and even though we had baggage, even though we had a past, 
Even though we had sin in our lives, Jesus still loved us. And he did not love us to take advantage of us. He loved us to take care of us. And Jesus pursued us. And he lived his life in, in our place. And he did exactly what was right. And he did not sin against us, right? And so Jesus is the one who ultimately sacrificed his life for us. He did not live it for himself, but he lived it for us. So much so that Jesus went to the cross and all that baggage, all that past, all that sin that we have done, and even that's been done to us, Jesus dies for that sin, the Bible says, to purify our past and to purify our present and even to purify our future. And the Bible says that after Jesus died, he did not want to just be a good example. He did not want to just be a bright spot in history. Jesus came back to life, and Jesus is the one who continues to pursue after you today to have a relationship with him. Only a relationship with Jesus can give us that pattern in how we are supposed to live out our relationships with the person that God has for us in our future. I was in my discipleship group this past Monday. I think this is so cool. So here I am talking with these guys at this table at Arby's at 4.30 in the afternoon and, and, and we went through Ruth 1 and 2 together and we went through these, all these passages talking about all this stuff and how God was speaking to them and one dude spoke up and here's what he said. He said, Chip, you know what? I was working one time and in, in, in my job, I guess, hired, hired this girl. And he said, this girl was like two years older than me. He said, this chick was two years older than I was. And he says, man, dude, she was hot, right? Like she was a good looking girl. And he said, I was so attracted to her. And so we had all these, all these like same interests and everything. And we hit it off and we liked all the same things. And he's like, dude, I just, I liked her so much. And then she started flirting with my friend my friend who was two years older than me as well. And so she ended up saying to, to this buddy, to this friend, hey, I, I want to date you. And the, the buddy, the dude, the friend turned her down. And so this guy goes to his friend. He's like, are you serious? Like, she is so beautiful. And she is so fun and she's so cool and all this kind of stuff. Why would you turn her down? And his buddy told him, dude, she doesn't have a heart for the Lord. Why would I date her? What would we have in common? And in our discipleship group, this dude said, it never even dawned on me that that was supposed to be the priority. And then he looked at me and he said, I have never been taught this stuff. I have never had a lesson when it comes to relationships in dating in thinking through these things. I, I want to save you from pain, right? Like Jesus wants to save you from hurt. He's saying, apply these things to my life and you won't become another statistic. So real quick, Last five things I'm going to say, I'm just going to say them real fast. Number one, don't overdate. Don't create those patterns. Number one, don't overdate. Don't create those patterns in your life that will set you up for divorce later. Number two, raise your requirements. Raise your requirements. And the first question you ask them is, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. Don't say, are you saved? Don't ask, are you a Christian? Don't ask, do you go to church? You ask open-ended questions. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. How did you give your life to him? How have you been growing spiritually? What has God been teaching you through his church? And if they can't answer those questions according to the word of God, then they are not ready to be with you. Because God sets up relationships in our life to point us to Jesus. Number three, every day pray for your future spouse. 
Because when you pray for your future spouse, you will not waste time with the wrong person. So every day you pray for your future spouse, number four, only go on a green light. Which means never get into a relationship without God giving you the okay, without praying first and God giving you the obvious green light to get into it. And then number five, always, always, always live from the gospel. Live from the gospel. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, I just, man, I want you just to focus and I want you to zone in. I just want you to give your attention to God right now. Not to me, not to those around you, not to things going on in this room. Man, this is between you and God right here, right now. How many of y'all would say tonight, Pastor Chip, and you may have done this before, you may have never done this before, but how many of y'all would say, Pastor Chip, right here and right now tonight, I just want to commit or recommit myself. I want to be patient, and I want to wait and I want to be faithful to God, and I want to obey Him, and I want to do everything possible in my life to end up with His person for the rest of my life, my husband or my wife. Would you raise your hand right now? I want to live for God in such of a way that every day, every day points forward to the future that God would reveal to me that person for my life. I want to do everything in my power. On the count of three, if you mean that, hands up, one, two, three, go. If you mean that, hands up between you and God, between you and God, let's go. Hands up. Awesome. You can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. How many of you would just be very honest and nobody looking around but me right now? And, I, man, I don't want to embarrass you at all. I don't want to embarrass you at all. But how many of you right now would say, Pastor Chip, I, I would love that. I would love for God to bless my relationship. But I've never really given my life to God. I don't know if God can bless me because I've never given my life to him. I don't live my life for him. And tonight, tonight is the night that you can begin a relationship with God, which will define all of your relationships from now. That you can say, God, I want to give my life to you. I believe that Jesus died for me, forgives me of my sin, risen from the dead, and, and I want to live my life for him. With nobody looking around but me, would you just raise your hand right now and say, Pastor Chip, would you pray for me? I need to give my life to God. Would you raise your hand right now? Raise your hand right now just, and just, just so I can see you real quick and put your hand back down. Make sure I can see you. You can even just barely look up at me. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Raise your hand right now. All right, I really appreciate your honesty in that. Thank you. Here's what I want you to do. Tonight, just like last week we prayed, God, May I be patient and may I wait for the person you have for me. Tonight, I want you to ask God, God, would you make me into the person you want to be so that I would be that perfect person for the husband or wife that you are preparing me for? God, make me into that person. Help me to wait. That I would not get into wrong relationships. That I would not waste my time on other people. God, I want, to, I want to use my life to serve you and one day to find them. Let's pray that right now. Let's pray that right now. That God would make you into that person, that you would be ready when it's time for him to bring along that relationship for the rest of your life. Y'all pray when, and just go to God. And whenever you get done praying, the band will lead and you can stand up and join them in worship. Y'all pray.